looking at, uh, uh, as we've been going through the Bible and looking at several different things, we went through the book of John, as you know, we spent uh, several months, several months, almost a year over looking at just who Jesus Christ is. And then last week we looked at uh, maintaining good works and how we as, as Christians need to make sure that we maintain good works. Many times us preachers have uh, an issue that uh, I think is common with most of us preachers is uh, we tell you what you ought to be doing, but yet we never teach you how to do those things. And uh, it's like a child when I saw this morning Jocelyn was walking into church and, and she had tripped several times when Mama was holding her hand and, and then she uh, blew a, a tire, she blew a shoe and so she's picking up showing everyone still walking and you know when a baby starts to walk parents are there teaching her and and when they start coloring, I know uh, Addie in the office, I'll help her with her hand. And I see her mother doing it and Grammy doing it. And, and we teach them how to do it. Well, I want to do that for the next couple of weeks. Some principles and some things that I do to help me in the Christian life. My desire for you is to have a Christian life that is successful, that is joyous, that you are victorious in your life, not that you don't get beat up and knocked down once in a while, but that you have a victorious Christian life. How many of you want a victorious Christian life? Now, I'm not saying you don't have right now, okay? I'm not saying that. But I believe that all of us ought to have a desire to have a successful Christian life. In this passage of Scripture, Psalm 119, if you'd open your word, the Word of God to Psalm 119, Psalm 119, I want us to look at it for the next couple of weeks and, and may not make it through the message today. And I don't want to rush through this. Just give you some principles that I use for my life as I approach the different issues in life and uh, the different things that will help me. And uh, the very first thing here is if you look at Psalm 119, verse 9, it says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? With my whole heart have I sought thee. O let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Then look up at verse 15. I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. And then if you jump over to verse 33, it says, Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I shall keep it unto the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me to go in the path of thy commandments, for therein do I delight. How many of you have ever heard this phrase? When all else fails, read the what? Instructions. When all else fails, read the instructions. Here, uh, several weeks ago, I would say a few days ago, but my wife says several weeks ago, I was using the microwave. And uh, it was running, and, and it had about five seconds left, and Addie was asleep on the sofa, and my wife had already, you know, I, I spoke, and she said, quiet down. Don't use that voice. You've got to be quiet. And I was heating something in the microwave, and I thought, that belt's going to go off. That buzzer's going to go off. Addie's going to wake up. My wife is going to, um, in love, she's going to chastise me. And so I'm going to open the door so that it doesn't, the buzzer doesn't go off. Now, I don't know about y'all, ours goes off and then it keeps going off and then it'll stop and then it'll keep going off again. I'm like, you told me once, just be quiet. So I grabbed the door, I opened it up and it went, I mean, nothing. Clock's out, I shut it, nothing's working. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. And I pulled up a few things and... 
and it said, well, you probably burned the board up, and I looked at a board, and you can get a new microwave for $300, or you can buy the board for $250. I'm thinking, I think I'm going to have to buy a new microwave. And my wife keeps, we don't use the microwave much. You never realize how much you use that thing until you don't have it. How many have ever found that? And so uh, yesterday morning, I'm like, I've got to start looking up and finding out where I can find another microwave like it so I can pop it in and, and uh, so that I can get that to-do list up to date and, and, and finish that. And, and I thought, well, I wonder if anyone else has ever had a problem with theirs before. So I went to the greatest resource, YouTube. And they said, first things first, check the fuse. I'm like, there's a fuse in this thing? I should know that. And sure enough, there's a fuse in there. And it takes you, you got to go through about 70 screws to get to this. <laughs> there ought to be a side panel. You pop the panel off, there it is, and you're done with it. No, you got to take the face off. And, and I'm taking a screw out and the whole side of the plastic because they make them so, I mean, they make these things, they last forever. And uh, the whole tab broke off. I'm thinking, now how is the thing going to stay? And I'm going to have to buy one anyway. So I'm thinking, I'm going to have to drill a hole in the top and, and put it through this. And, and uh, sure enough, there it was. And I put it in, and you'll never believe what happened. Lights came on, started working again, and, and uh, shared the good news with my wife. And she's like, well, you didn't do dishes. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, I fixed your microwave. That ought to be enough for, I mean, you know, uh, all kinds of wonderful things. But, you know, how often do we work? And I shouldn't speak to you. I'll speak to myself because men never, we don't need an instruction manual. We don't need uh, to look at how to do certain things because we are men. We can figure it out. But if you just read the instruction manual, it'd say, oh, I didn't realize that's what I needed to do. How many have heard this? If you put something together and you don't have three or four extra screws, you didn't do it right. You always have to have some left out parts on it. I was, uh, the, uh, the engine uh, repair place, the, the check engine uh, facility in Holland, we've taken some stuff there to be worked on before. I was talking to him and, and I said, hey, you used to have a hired man here helping you. He said, yeah, I don't anymore. And he said, it's just too costly. And I said, well, what happened? He said, he completely tore a motor to part put it back together, and there was one bolt on the, in, the, in the little magnetic tray. And I said to him, this bolt kind of looks important. It's not greasy. It's clean. It looks like an internal part. He goes, no, nah, I don't know where it went. He said, I don't think it's important. He said, I, I put it together. It ran. It sounded good. So he said to the lady, he said, now listen, if something happens to your vehicle, please call us. I don't think there will be, but if something does, and she made it three and a half miles, and the engine let go. I guess that was a pretty important bolt. Uh, I say that because I say, and we, we hear this often, that listen, you need to have a successful Christian life. You ought to have a victorious Christian life. Listen, we, have already, we are living in the side that's already won. The Lord's already won the battle. We are victorious if we allow God to run our life. So how do we live a victorious Christian life? How do we live a, a, a life that is pleasing to God? Well, I believe we have to go to the instruction manual. The very first thing that we ought to do is look at God's Word. How do you approach the Bible? Now, I say all the time, read the Bible. Uh, I was at a, a place, and, and Pastor uh, Haglin encourages his people to read through the Bible in a year, but more important than that, to just read the Bible. I try to encourage you all, just read the Bible. Take the Bible and start to read it. But, okay, that's wonderful. But how do you approach the Bible? How do I approach the Bible? When I open it up in the morning and I read the Bible, how do I approach it? I know several, but Potter, you have a, a, a way that you approach the Bible when you read it and you look at it and it's been very successful in your life. But uh, some points that I use to try to help me glean as much as I can from the Bible, from the Word of God. How do I do this? 
in, the, in reading the Bible. You know, I think of what uh, President Roosevelt said. He says, a thorough knowledge of the Bible is worth more than a college education. I believe that. I believe education is important, but I believe a knowledge of God's Word is even more important. I think of Woodrow Wilson said, I am sorry for men who do not read the Bible every day. I wonder why they deprive themselves of the strength and the pleasure that it brings. You know, when we read the Bible, you know, there is no book like the Bible. There is no book more important than the Bible. Uh, when I was up to Gaylord, I took two books with me uh, to read and, and to look at some things and study. And, and one was, which I rarely ever do, is just some extracurricular reading to, uh, to, to encourage me. And then I took a book on doctrines and in the Bible doctrines that we believe. But uh, those books are great, but nothing should be more important than the Bible. God's holy word. Why? Because for the Christian, it is a source of our spiritual growth, guidance, and godliness. Because of the importance of the Bible to our Christian life, the Bible should be standard equipment for our lives. It ought to be something that we read and study every day. How do you approach the Bible? Let me give you a few, uh, three things, and we probably won't make it all through today, uh, this morning, but how should we read the Bible? I believe the most important thing when you open up your Bible in the morning is to begin your Bible reading prayerfully. You ought to go to God and spend a few moments in prayer before you open the Bible or before you start to read the Bible. You ought to go to God in prayer. You know, as you uh, read your Bible, you should approach uh, and, and begin your Bible reading prayerfully. How do you do that? You look at Psalm 119, verse 18. It says, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Now, like the psalmist, when we read the Bible, we should first ask God to give us understanding in the reading. You remember what Jesus Christ said to the disciples? He says, it's imperative that I go in John 14 and then in John, excuse me, 16. He says, it's important that I go. I will send you a comforter and he shall guide you in all what? Truth. He is going to take what you read and study and know, and He will use that in your life. He will guide you in that pathway. And so you read God's Word, and, and you approach it prayerfully. You're like the psalmist, when we read the Bible, we should first ask God to help us. So we must approach the Bible and reading prayerfully, because why? It is a divinely inspired book. It is divinely inspired. It is like no other book in all of the world. The Bible is the living Word of God. So when you approach this, you approach it in prayer. What does the Bible say in, in 2 Timothy 3.16? It says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. The word Scripture means holy or sacred writings. I believe this is the Word of God. I believe it is a book to help us and to encourage us. We were, I uh, forget where my wife and I was, we were, we were out and talking about the college years last Sunday evening. Uh, I spoke at Rose Park and, and uh, we were talking to a couple that we've known since college and, and we started asking, do you remember uh, British literature? Remember that class? Tim Rasmussen taught that class. And, and how divinely inspiring it was not. Uh, how about history of civilization? I know those books are important, but this teacher had the ability 
to make it the most boring class in all the world. And, and, and you always started out, and I've told you this before, every, every day, every single morning of class. And it wasn't one of those classes that you had just twice a week. Now this was, uh, you know, four days a week, history of civilization. And, and you'd start out, say, okay, take a half a sheet of paper, put your name and the date on the top, number one to ten, and here's... He'd ask us nine questions, nothing that he had talked about the day before in class. It all came from the reading from the assignment the night before. And then the tenth, the, 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 the tenth question was always the most important. And if you didn't get it right, your whole quiz was wrong. Did you read your entire assignment? Well, man, I know that these nine are right. But I have a dilemma, God. Do I tell him the truth? No. My wife read it for me. No, she didn't read it for me. Uh, do I tell him the truth? And, and, and you take that quiz, and, and we're talking about that class. You said, what did you do? Now, it is the only class in college that I got a D. Everything was A's and B's except for history of civilization. I received a D. You said, what'd you do? Threw the biggest party us married students could think of. We brought pizza and Mountain Dew and junk food. And we, we talked about having a sacrifice to the Lord and burn all the books, but put too much money in those books. Better keep them around for a while. You know, you study those books and, and to pass a class so that I could get a degree. But we ought to study God's Word because it helps us live a life that is pleasing to God. Yesterday, I had to run to Otsego to pick up that uh, little, little uh, fuse, and, and uh, they had it at Home Depot, and so I was going, and if anyone was around Otsego yesterday, I'm driving up through there, and all of a sudden, it is shut down because they have a festival. I'm thinking, seriously? Couldn't you start it after I got through? And then the Holy Spirit says, couldn't have you left a little early in the morning when you could have, but you didn't. You know, so what did I do? I, I said, okay, if I take a left here and there's cars, I can go down here and do this and come up and I can make it around. And the thought hit me as I'm doing that. That's life. Man, everything is going wonderful and everything is going great and, and you're having a wonderful day and all of a sudden you hit a roadblock or you, you hit a, an impasse in your life. And what do you have to do? You have to rely upon God to help you through that. How do you do that? Through God's Word. Through the Bible. He said, He shall guide you in all truth. It's divinely inspired. You know, identifying the Bible as Scripture sets it apart from any other writing. The word all, all Scripture is given by inspiration. It indicates that every word is holy and sacred. It is a book given by inspiration of God. The word inspired literally means God breathed. As we breathe out, we exhale what we have breathed in. Now, we are not breathing in and breathing out the Bible, but God breathed this Word to us. And so when we read the Bible, we are bringing it into our life. Again, I don't believe it contains the Word of God. I believe it is the Word of God. I've heard preachers out there say, they listen, this is a, we don't need this passage of Scripture. This passage of Scripture isn't for us, or this really isn't relevant to us. I read the Bible, it says all Scripture. I realize some is written to a particular people. But there's not one principle, not one passage of Scripture that we cannot pull and glean from. You say, well, the Old Testament isn't for us. All the Scripture is for us. All of the Bible. So you look at this book realizing that it is a, it is a wonderful, divinely inspired book. You know, it is not of human origin, although man written over, over 40 authors and over 1,500 years it took to get the Bible. I think of what someone has written. The authorship of this book is wonderful. Here are words written by kings, by emperors, by princes, by poets, by sages, by philosophers, by fishermen, by statesmen, by men 
learned in, all, uh, learned in the wisdom of Egypt, educated in the schools of Babylon, trained at the feet of rabbis in Jerusalem, rabbis in Jerusalem. It was written by men in exile in the desert, in the shepherd's tents, in green pastures and beside still waters. Among its authors, we find the fishermen, the tax gatherer, the herdsmen, the gatherer of sycamore fruit. We find poor men, rich men, statesmen, preachers, exiles, captains, legislators, judges, men of every grade and class. The authorship of this book is wonderful beyond all other books. You know, the Bible may be a book with a compilation of writers, but it originated from God. Their style of writing may have been there, but God is the author of the, of the Bible. So when you look at the Bible, never look at the Bible as just another book. This is God's Word written to us. So you start it out in prayer, say, God, give me something wonderful out of your book. It is also divinely interpreted. It is divinely interpreted. A.W. Tozer said this, The Bible is a supernatural book and can be understood only by supernatural aid. You know, some says, well, I just don't understand the Bible. Now, for a new Christian, I get that. But you can't fully understand the Bible unless you're saved. The Holy Spirit helps illuminate the Word of God as we'll look at. The Holy Spirit will bring back to remembrance that which you have read, that which you are said. He'll help guide you. He'll help lead you. He'll help strengthen you. So the Bible is divinely interpreted. You see, when you read the Bible, and since God is the author, God can give us understanding. Why? I ask the Lord, Lord, open my eyes, open my wisdom, open my understanding that what I read this morning, I'll glean something from. And, and there are times, there are words that I come across I don't understand. And, and I have help books in my, in my office, in my library, I have some at home and, and would, would be, uh, give you any of them or show you the books that I use. What does this word mean? Or where is this word used in other places? But God gives us wisdom and understanding in His book. You look at this. It's why we prayerfully approach it. God, give me something this morning. Give me wisdom when I read this. Or, or tonight as, as I go to bed, give me some understanding in the Bible. Be a teacher to me. You know, a person can have a Ph.D. and not understand the Word of God. Person can be educated, but yet be a complete fool to the Word of God. Why? It is God's book. He gave it to us for understanding. You know, years passed, and, and I remember when they would, preachers would say it is divinely illuminated. Illumination means that we must rely on divine assistance to understand spiritual things. You know, when you read the Bible, ask God to give you understanding. That's why, I, I listen, if you can read through the Bible in a year and get full understanding, I'm for that. Read the Bible. But don't rush through the Bible where you get nothing out of it. You're not going to get a quiz at the end of the year and say, okay, everybody here at New Hope Baptist Church, I want you to take out a half a sheet of paper. I want you to give me your attendance. I want you to give me this. I want you to give me this. And then, have you read through the Bible completely this year? And if you've not read through the Bible at least one time this year, you failed. No, our question ought to be, did you read the Bible this year? Did you read Scripture each and every morning? It may be five verses. There's times that I'll say, okay, I want to read five chapters or ten tap chapters this morning, and I make it through ten verses. And I find myself going back and reading those ten verses again, and, and then I'll start cross-referencing some verses, and, I, and it's helping me. I'm gleaning from this. That's more important than at the end of the year say, hey, I read through my Bible in a year. We need to read God's Word, though. Why? Because it is a book that will help us and guide us in life. 
this book is a wonderful book. You know, like the psalmist, we need to ask that God will open our eyes to behold wondrous things from His Word. You know, when we read our Bible, this is where we must start, reading our Bible prayerfully. When we approach God's Word, each and every time that I open the Bible up, whether it be in the morning or afternoon or evening, I always start it out and say, God, give me something from this book. Give me understanding. Lead me in something that's going to help me today. Give me wisdom. Talking to the pastor this morning, he said, you know, he said, Brother Butler, he said, pray for me. I have my message prepared for the church service this morning, but uh, I don't know, should I go a different direction? And, and should I go this direction? I'll have a hurting church this morning. And my response is the same as a response that I've received. God will give you wisdom in what to do this morning. Why? Because he's in the Bible. Spending time with God. It's important to read the Bible because God gives you wisdom. God gives you understanding. God gives you knowledge. But you always start it in prayer. Charles Spurgeon said, Do you wish to begin to be true readers? Will you henceforth labor to understand? Then you must get to your knees. You must cry to God for direction. Secondly, we need to continue our Bible reading thoughtfully. You know, when it comes to reading the Bible, there is not a set way to read the Bible. There are some, there are different ways. Brother Potter, uh, in the mornings, and we have talked, and you get up and you study the Bible, and, you, and you're reading through, and you have a pen, and you're, or you do word study, and so you're writing every word and studying every word, but you're studying the Bible. Brother Irvin writes in the Bible, and, and as he's reading, he's writing the Bible out. I think he's done it five or six times now, completely from Genesis 1 to the last verse of of Revelation. He has written the Bible out. I approach it a little different than those two things. Most of the time I read the Bible, I don't use this. I have, uh, I have some passages are much more written on. And I look at your Bible, Brother Potter, and I look at Irvin's Bible. I'm like, man, I, I, I mean, you're talking about giving me ADD. That would really do it. I wouldn't be able to focus at all. Most of the time I read from a Bible that has not been written in, and, and I'll have a little a pad. I've told you I'll have a pad of paper there, and if a verse jumps out at me, I'll write that verse down, maybe complete the chapter, come back, and then I'll start looking at that verse, cross-referencing that verse as well. But I say, Lord, give me something. You have to come to a way in how you read the Bible, what works for you, what time of the day works for you. I've started to read my Bible before, and, and I, I did this, this just on, uh, on uh, <clears throat> trying to think of the day, Thursday. Thursday morning I got up, and I was reading through the book of 1 Corinthians and, and early in the morning, and I was reading through, and I looked up, and I was thinking of a thought on something completely different than the Bible. Something I needed to do. And so I looked back down and where did I leave off at? None of that looks familiar this morning. Oh, it looks familiar. I've read through it before. But man, did I read that? And so I went back and I started over again. One, one chapter, I read that chapter three times. Because just a thought would hit and I'd get away from it. You say, what did you do, Pastor? I shut my Bible, spent some time in prayer, and said, I'll pick it up later. I'm not going to force myself to reading if my attention is not on that book and on that passage of Scripture. Why? Because I'm not trying to take my Bible reading chart and say, okay, I can mark this chapter off and I can mark this chapter off. And at the end of the year, I can say, look, I read through my Bible. I want to understand and I want to glean something from His Word. So I'm asking God, if, I, if my prayer is, Lord, give me something, interpret this Bible, and I don't even remember where I read because my mind is in a different place, there's just no sense of keep on reading. How many of you have been there before? You, I mean, preaching, I, that's why I depend upon you. Why do you need to stay awake? Why do you need to stay alert? Because sometimes, oftentimes, I will, uh, where was I? 
where was I on that? Last week, my son said, the staff, Moses, threw it down. I'm like, oh, yeah. And then, you know, those that listen online, they said, man, I was listening to you last week, Pastor, and you dug a hole and thinking, which one? That's often. Well, you said this. I said, I remember that. You know, it came here, and what I was thinking did not come out there. How many of you have ever done that before? And what is my prayer on Sunday morning? Lord, please. Give me wisdom and only let me say what you want said. And God will say, well, if you just stick with the message, that's okay. But those rapid trails and elephant trails get out of the way once in a while. What I'm saying with reading your Bible, when you look at God's Word, approach it prayerfully. God, give me something this morning. There have been times when I have said, Lord, give me something this morning, and I spend a long period of time in prayer. I may only read a verse or two, and I've got to go out. There is nothing wrong with that as well. You don't have to set an alarm clock on how much you read or how much you don't, but always start it in prayer. Why? You're reading His book. Well, how to go to Him in prayer. You also see, we continue our Bible reading thoughtfully. Now, when it comes to reading the Bible, there is, again, not a set way. You must adopt a method that works best for you. And you can curtail it. I have, uh, throughout the years of reading, this, this is what works for me, and this is what I enjoy. My wife has a completely different way of how she reads her Bible and approaches her Bible and what she does in her Bible reading. You know, it's not uh, a matter of, of being able to read our Bible. It's more that we choose not to. So our goal is not just to get into the Bible, but our goal is, is to get the Bible into us. How do I maintain a good Christian life? I get God's Word into me. I, I put God's Word into me to work. The psalmist said in one, Psalm 119, back in our, our scripture, Psalm 119, verse 15, I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. I will meditate in thy precepts. So when you look at this, the psalmist stated that he would meditate on the Word of God. He was speaking of thoughtfully reading God's Word. Now, once we have asked God to open our eyes and understand His Word, then we must thoughtfully read His Word as we look at and we study His Word. By thoughtfully, I mean that when we read the Bible, that we want it to speak to our hearts. God, give me something this morning. Give me something out of Your Word this morning. You see, the difference in the Bible from all other books is that all other books were written for information. But the Bible was written for transformation. When you read the Bible, you want it to transform your life. You want it to make a, a definitive change in your life. Every day I want to be closer to God. January 1st seemed like yesterday. But you know what? Uh, December 31st is going to be tomorrow. Tuesday is October 1st. How quickly has this year went by? Nine months have gone. Three months left. We were in the store. We, you know, if you go to Gaylord, there's a store you have to go to. Jay's. Just you have to. And on the radio station, they had the uh, community, uh, those in the community came and spoke. And, and I didn't have to show up on this day until 9.30. They said, hey, we have a community guest, and uh, he is the director. He runs Jay's Sports uh, Shop on, uh, uh, in Gaylord. I said, man, I'll be there at 20 minutes till 9. I'll bring coffee or whatever else. And so I was there and, and had a wonderful time talking to him, listened to his testimony, and we thought, hey, he came and visited us. Derek, we probably ought to go visit them. So we went over there, and, and I was trying to, to help Brother Haglin. He, he's uh, uh, a major, majorly deficient on anything outdoors when it comes to hunting. And I was looking for something, Darren, I told you, uh, we'll have to change it and put it on my bow. Uh, I, I bought a purple kisser button. 
Uh, you say, why purple? Well, a couple years ago, I had some fletchings that needed to be changed on my arrows, and Darren said, hey, I'll fletch them up for you, and he made them purple and white. He was being funny, killed the biggest buck I've ever killed. I'm like, turn them all purple and white. He turned my bow purple, that's fine. You say, would you ever hunt with a pink bow? I won't wear pink, but I'd hunt with a pink bow if it helped me kill bucks. Uh, I just, just, you know. So we were over there, and, and uh, I was going someplace again. That's why you have to uh, uh, listen uh, for it. But, you know, all of that, you go there, and you look at, and you're getting things, and, and, and you're studying. It's information, and, and listening to his story, and how uh, Jay started out, and, and, and the information there. But uh, you look at God's Word, and I said, hey, I needed to get there. I didn't get there that early. I did get there by 9 o'clock and, and wanted to spend some time with them. But I didn't want to miss reading the Bible. I didn't want to miss that time with God. Nothing should take precedence. You say, man, I, I just can't wake up in the morning. Try to go to bed a little earlier. E, or, or take the time at night to, to read the Bible. The Bible was written for transformation. We do not read the Bible to make us scholars. We read the Bible to make us saints. That's why I read the Bible. The first thing in this, when we continue reading the Bible thoughtfully, ask yourself this question. Is there a promise to accept here? Is there a promise to accept? As you read uh, a verse or chapter, ask, is there a promise from God in these verses that I can claim in my Christian life? Is there something that I can glean from in this? I preached and I mentioned it to the church on, on Wednesday night, Grace Baptist. I mentioned the message. I preached a, a, a faithful in the midst of, of trials. And I preached on Daniel and Josiah and I said, I preached this. I, I changed several things. I preached it at uh, Jocelyn's uh, um, dedication service. But I was reading through and and I read further, and I wanted to study a little bit more about Josiah's life. And of course, uh, Daniel, we know that he purposed in his heart. And we jumped over to, uh, as I was down reading this passage of Scripture, and I read all the way up through uh, verse Second Chronicles 34. And he began to reign at the age of 8, and then at the age of 12, and at the age of 16, and at the age of 20. And, and I purged the land, and purged the city, and purged the, 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 the temple, and started worshiping. And then I said, you know... I ought to read about his death because I know he died at the age of 39. And so I was reading down through here and I got over to 2 Chronicles chapter 35 and down to verse 22, I'll start verse 20 in 2 Chronicles 35. After all of this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, Necho, king of Egypt, came up to fight against uh, Sharmish, the Ephrodite, and, and, and Josiah went out against him. But he sent ambassadors to him, saying, What have I to do with thee, thou king of Judah? I come not against thee this day, but against the house wherewith I have war. For God commanded me to make haste, forbear thee from meddling with God, who is with me, that he destroy thee not. Nevertheless, Josiah was not, would not turn his face from him, but disguised himself that he might fight with him and hearken not unto the words of Necho from the mouth of God and came and fought, with, fought in the valley of Megiddo. And the archer shot the king, Josiah. And the king said to his servants, Have me away, for I am sore wounded. Now I read that passage of Scripture because I said, Lord, give me something. I'm studying for a message, but give me something. And I came to that passage of Scripture, and I've read it before, but it just seemed to jump out at me. The Bible says that Josiah disguised himself. When I say that, is there something, is there a principle, is there a promise, something that I can claim? And I looked at that and thought, here's the king. He was warned not to go. The king of Egypt said, God told me to go to war. You were not to interfere, Josiah. I know who you are. I know who you serve. Don't come up to war. And Josiah said, I'm going to go anyway. And he disguised himself. And I thought that's what a lot of Christians do. 
The Bible says don't do it, and we say, well, I think I can. And we disguise ourselves like the world, and we say, well, listen, I'm going to hide my Christianity. I'm going to hide who I am. I'm going to go out with them, and it never, ever turns out good for us. You say, well, it had nothing to do with Josiah. It had everything to do. A principle that I pulled out. I looked over and I wrote down on, 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 on Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Josiah did not go out as the king. He went out just like everybody else. He wanted to do what the soldiers were doing and fight. Listen, we don't have to do what the world does. We don't have to act like the world, look like the world, do the things of the world. Uh, it's what I'm saying is when you read the Bible, say, Lord, give me something. I've read that passage of Scripture and, and read it through over, but it just seemed like those words jumped out at me, and I started writing things down and started comparing Scripture with it and, and started looking at other verses. That's how you approach the Word of God. Thoughtfully, what can God give me? You know, these promises we can claim for strength, comfort, wisdom, guidance, as well as every other need in our life. Vance Havener said this, Many Christians are sitting on the promises when they ought to be standing on the promises. Think about it. We are sitting next to the premise when we ought to be standing on the promises. Listen, God's Word has made so many promises to us. You say, well, I just couldn't help it. Is it we couldn't help it, or we didn't have a desire to? Remember what the book of James, and I looked over at that, and, and, and in the book of James where it talks about how we are not to blame God for uh, what we have done and, and, and the things if we find ourselves in trouble. It's not because of James. It says, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. Listen, we cannot blame God. We allowed that to come in our life. What's the best thing to do is heed the Word of God. Heed the warnings of God's Word. So when you approach the Bible, pray that God will give you something. And then when you're reading, think about it and say, God, reveal something. Reveal a promise for me. Something that I can stand on. John Fisher, Bishop of Rochester, was led to the Tower of London. He saw the scaffold upon which he was to be beheaded. He took out his pocket, uh, Greek New Testament, and looked up toward heaven and prayed, Now, O Lord, direct me to some passage which may support me through this awful scene. Those that were next to him heard him pray this. He opened the book, and his eyes fell on John 16, 32. Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. And immediately he said, praise God. Praise God. I'm not alone. You see, when you wake up in the morning or at night, you say, Lord, give me something in your book. Give me a promise. The Bible says that God will give it to us. God will lead it. This is how I do it. So in this closing, God's promises are sufficient for now and for eternity. You know, when and like John Fisher, we can rest in God's promises. So when you read the Bible, look for promises that God has made. Why? God never gives you something that He will not bring to pass. God will give you a promise, whether it's peace, whether it's victory, whether it's strength, whether it's understanding, whether it's comfort, whether it's the ability to say, no, I don't want to be a part of this. Or the promise of joy. Mark these promises. Trust these promises. Accept them as a promise that God has made to you. You know, this book here, one of the things I, I love about this book, Brother Mitch, is it's, it's for me. It's for me. It isn't for us. It's for me. And you can take your Bible and say, yes, preacher, but it's for me. This book is personal. See, I can read it. I can preach it. 
but I have to live it. You can come and you can hear it, but you still need to read it and live it as well. The promises God made to me are the same promises that He made to you. Why is it important to read the Bible? Because you get an understanding of who God is. You get an understanding of the promises that have been made to you. So when you read your Bible, when you read this book, first of all, and we'll finish this, there's a principle to apply. We'll look at this next week, but when you read the Bible, start your, start your Bible reading out in prayer. Spend some time with God, and, 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 and I don't know about you, but uh, so often, so much is running through my mind. I, at night, I'll, I'll lay down, and, and I'll be talking to my wife, and four words in, she's gone. I mean, she can lay down, she is gone. How many, how many of you are like that? I could be dead tired sitting on the sofa, and when I go to bed, I'm wide awake. The other morning, 2 o'clock in the morning, my wife said, well, you drank some tea with caffeine in it. But my mind wasn't shutting down. I just, so many things were running through it. So I read some scripture, listened to some music to comfort my heart. That's the God we serve. God gives us this book. Read the Bible. Spend some time in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, for your goodness. And, and Lord, a, a different subject and way we approach this and, and how it's so important to take your Bible and, and to read your Bible uh, and spend time in your Word as we will look at here next week, but how we must approach it in prayer. We must approach it thoughtfully. Lord, give us something. Uh, clear my mind. Clear my thoughts. Clear anything that might distract me from getting something from your book. Lord, my desire for New Hope Baptist Church and those that are visiting, those that are members and those that uh, may be watching this morning is that they will have a victorious Christian life and they will be like the psalmist that says, Teach me, O Lord. Teach me thy word. Teach me thy precepts. Teach me thy Bible. Give me something, Lord. Lord, I pray that each and every person in here will take time each and every day to read the Bible. It might only be a few verses, might be several chapters. But Lord, that we will start reading, and I know I've talked about this before and emphasized this, but Lord, as we approach the end of the year and we approach a pivotal moment in our country coming up here in, in just a month and a half, Lord, I pray that you'll help us as Christians to, to dive into your word and get a better understanding and a better knowledge and, and stand firm upon your principles, your promises, and your doctrine. Lord, help us. Lord, if someone here this morning does not know you as their personal Savior, I pray they do not leave without nailing salvation down or getting the assurance of their salvation. It starts with that. Lord, we really can't understand or even read your book without, first of all, knowing you as our personal Savior. Most important thing, and Lord, if, if there's those that are just dealing with some things, maybe there's iniquity or sin in their life, that they will make it right with you and ask for forgiveness so that they can have the fellowship with you restored. Lord, help us to be a light in this community. Help us to stand upon your word. Lord, if someone here this morning doesn't know you as your Savior, I pray that they'll come forward, that they will receive you. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Maybe someone here this morning said, Pastor, I don't know for sure I'm saved. I pray you don't leave here without knowing. I pray you'll come forward. If you're a man, I'll have a man show you a lady. I'll have a lady. We'll show you from God's Word or catch me afterwards. Say, Pastor, can we talk? Maybe you're going through a trial and maybe the road that you're on has been blocked and, and you have to go a roundabout way. Just follow God's Word. Follow God's Word. Lord, help us these next few moments, we pray in your precious and holy name. Amen. Let's stand.